welcome back my passive income investors i like to a deep dive analysis of my 260 thousand dollar dividend stock portfolio as many of you og subscribers might be aware i started this channel back in 2019 when i barely had over a hundred thousand dollars since then every month over the month i've been documenting not only the capital that i've been adding to my portfolio the growth including the dividend income and i have achieved a goal that i didn't think i would reach till the end of this year heck even mid of next year as i continue to chisel my portfolio into this refined beautiful passive income generating machine guys i always got to remind myself to take a step back and realize i don't need to be as risk adverse as i used to be because you look at the s p 500 that's been going up 20 percent year over year some of the safest investments in the world have been yielding really great results and you have to come to the conclusion that when you start getting into the six figure realm guys on every hundred thousand dollars if you just make 10 15 percent i mean that's 10 to fifteen thousand dollars on every hundred k which means my portfolio could realistically generate anywhere from 25 to even 40 thousand dollars at the current market average returns which in and of itself is a full-time income and i don't want to take that for granted so i always like to document this and teach you guys how i'm evolving through all of this and in incredible growth i mean a lot of us got very fortunate here through this pandemic but in light of all of this if you appreciate the clarity of my transparency just help the channel out a little bit hit that like button folks as we zoom out and get into this very deep dive analysis of my $260,671 dividend portfolio going into the uh, end of March here, folks. And just taking a look, the current dividend income, if we add all of it up across all these sectors, that at $8,129.25 or the equivalent of $677 a month. I mean, think about what $677 a month could buy you. Most of this is 100% tax-free income. And I do document this every month just to see what it is after taxes, withholding tax, all that that jargon and nonsense. And we can see that for the month of March, I received about $442 in dividends. Obviously, quarterly payments are a little bit more frequent with stocks. So that's why you'll see that I get these big spikes like at the beginning of the year when I got 885 In total, for the year of 2021, we're sitting around $1,700 in dividends, which God, that starts becoming a lot of money, man, like a, a crazy amount of money. But nonetheless, guys, let's just look at how much my portfolio value and my sector allocation is really changed here as I continue to try and to diversify that dividend income to make sure it's going to be more resilient and reliable because in this pandemic I saw some cuts from Rio can one of my REITs uh, GEO group of stock I used to hold did a big dividend cut I've experienced some pain along the way as I'm sure if you can see that red line uh, it gets a little choppy toward the top there because of the pandemic that kind of whiplash some of these companies but nonetheless let's just go through the portfolio values real quick so we've got consumer discretionary right here guys Guys, actually, this is kind of above me, I think, if you're if you're seeing it from my angle here. But above me here, we can see that consumer discretionary makes up 8% of my entire portfolio. Another 8% is made up of consumer staples. So consumer staples to me is my Pepsi, my Kimberly Clark. My consumer discretion is things like my MO and my BTI. I mean, it's a little can be debated, but still, that's kind of how I have that divvied up, making up 16%. We've got 15% in total just sitting in financials. So I thought this would be a little higher because banks have been on a tear lately, but this is my BNS, my TD, um, my Canadian Imperial Bank, etc. So taking a look, we got uh, in here, we got real estate now, guys, making up 16%. It's kind of weighed back a little bit. That's my real can and my stag. So I've got some awesome Canadian real estate and I've got some logistics going on in the US that's exposed to things like Amazon. Really proud of my uh, REIT allocation. Uh, taking a look, we got 9% making up healthcare. So this would purely be Johnson & Johnson. We've got 5% in a new sector in aeronautics. I love saying aeronautics. It's my favorite new sector of my whole portfolio, making up 5% being momentous, highly risky investment. I might be shuffling around shortly. And of course, Lockheed Martin, which is now paying a really healthy 3% yield in my portfolio. Finally, 23% is nicely weighted in my information and technology, which um, I'm going to be doing some adjusting here shortly as well, but not, not getting a whole lot of dividends out of there, which we'll see when we talk about the dividend pie. We got another new sector that I've yet to add into, but I kind of just finally tiptoe into 
Um, basically telecom guys, and I added Telus Communications, one of my more um, favorited telecom companies because they're evolving into telehealth. They do security, Wi-Fi, you know, your phone service. Really not a huge sector for me right now, but I like just diversifying as much as humanly possible within my understanding. Uh, and then finally here, guys, we got two little uh, last ones. So we got utilities making up 12%. Now utilities is actually my favorite sector of all time. I believe it's the most stable, and especially with the way the world is headed into renewables, uh, considering my large one of my largest holdings is Northland Power, which we'll see once I scroll down and I show you the individual holdings themselves. And then finally, 2% is cash. Now, in the cash pile, I am now including Bitcoin as part of that because my cash reserve is purely going to be an emergency fund, and it's going to be divvied between Canadian dollars, US dollars, and now Bitcoin, which again, we'll see when we get into the individual holdings. So moving into the dividend side of this portfolio, guys, it's really really interesting to see how all these different sectors kind of really offer different percentage weightings of income because they're both so they're also drastically different in how much they pay out. As we can see, even though consumer discretionary only makes up 8% of the portfolio, it makes up for 19% of my total income with well, let's start with the largest weighting. So REITs, even though they make up 16% of the portfolio, they drive in 24% of the total income, which I'm fine with. It started getting it to about a 30% weighting and I got uncomfortable at that level. But now that I've done some diversifying here, we can see it's come down slightly from the past when I've done these videos. Uh, so second in line, we've got financials, which is super awesome. I love the fact that financials can pay such a high yield. Again, making up 15% of the portfolio, but 21% of the income with consumer discretion coming in third place. So we've got REITs, financials, consumer discretion, kind of hiding over here. Utilities are paying up 12%. They're actually completely equal weighted to the, the portfolio value in and of itself. Kind of cool. But yeah, so that those one, two, three, four, five little um, sectors make up the vast majority of my dividend income with everything else just being slightly incremental. But keep in mind, guys, even though tech makes up the largest weighting of the whole portfolio, it only makes up 4% of the dividend income. But again, that's where a lot of the growth and the stability I'm finding in the upward trend of my portfolio comes from. So putting all of that aside, guys, this is what the general overview is looking like right now. So let's scroll down and just take a quick peek at the individual holdings. And before we do, I should shout this out. If you guys wanna support this channel, track your portfolio the exact same way I do here. I should recommend coming over to the chartmaster.com guys. Use coupon code passive income investor 15% off to track your portfolio the same way I do here. You only have to purchase one of these and you're going to get the whole suite of our portfolio trackers including our finance trackers, our compound calculators. You're getting a lot of awesome tools here and I really Spend some time, guys. Take a look at the analytical data. It's really fun. There's no monthly fees. It's a one-time fee. It supports the channel, and I would appreciate it. But getting back into this, folks, let's take a look at the individual holdings in and of themselves here. And things are really interesting, and I've never been so happy, and I say this a lot, but I'm getting more and more happy with the way my portfolio is slowly molding into this, to this passive income machine that I've desperately been spending several years working on. And we can see that um, Rio can, and the, my two largest holdings will start with obviously Rio Cam making up $30,000 in value, 12% of the entire portfolio. And then Stag here, or not Stag, sorry, I wish it was Stag. Stag's only making up like a, a very tiny percentage because I thought it was right next to my REIT. But I'm talking about Northland Power here, which makes up, uh, if I can find it, about $23,000 in value. And keep in mind, Northland Power used to be my largest position. It is my favorite stock of all time because it pays a monthly yield. I cap in over 5%. It's a utility in the natural energy sector and it has been spewing out capital for the longest time. It's one of the first stocks I ever bought. But somehow Rio Cam, because I was buying it very aggressively on the dips through 2020, has recovered quite nicely and is now the largest position in the portfolio. And I am not going to sell this. I don't want to scale it down. I really believe in Canadian real estate. I understand it very well and I like it a lot. So I'm going to leave these two being both Canadian companies, both very well positioned from my current buy prices. And yeah, I'm just going to let them do their thing, guys, while everything else starts to catch up and I reallocate my capital elsewhere. Some of the most controversial holdings right now, guys, um, obviously being Bitcoin, I'm trying to... to kind of protect my portfolio at this point by building up that emergency fund. As I have been really moving money around pretty aggressively lately, I've kind of understacked my cash. I do actually have a lot of cash I'm sitting on over 10,000, but you got to keep in mind from the capital gains and the income I'm making, I do have to pay tax. So when I've gone over my taxes, I literally have just about enough money to cover that. And I don't want to overstretch myself again. 
I have paid off my line of credit. I got no debts right now, so it's not like the biggest concern in the world. But still, I want to add, like I said, USD, Bitcoin, and Canadian dollars to my emergency fund. And I'm going to allocate about six to seven thousand dollars over the coming year to Bitcoin. I'm sitting about thirty two hundred dollars right now. I've got about two thousand in cash between USD and CAD. I want to get that up to about. 10 to 15,000. So I kind of want about 15,000 CAD, 5,000 Bitcoin ish. So it kind of equates to about $20,000 emergency fund. But other than that, nothing else is rather drastic here. Like, I, as you guys can see from the categories from aggressive growth to growth to dividends, I've really scaled back my aggressive growth. And I would put obviously Bitcoin in that category as well. I've now made it only 5% of the entire portfolio, mostly being in Momentus and ArcG. Even though ArcG, I have a hard time claiming that would be aggressive growth because it is a fairly well diversified ETF. Um, but nonetheless, one thing that is going to be coming up in the coming weeks here, guys, is I'm going to be liquidating all of my aggressive growth except for Bitcoin, but I am going to be liquidating um, a good healthy portion of my QQQM, my QQQM ETF, and I'm going to be buying it back under my corporate title being Passive Income Investor, Inc., and there's going to be a lot of shifting going around, which is why you're seeing me allocate a lot more toward dividend stocks right now, because I'm trying to just concrete what I want my personal portfolio to look like and what I want my corporation to look like, because my corporation is going to allow me to generate tax free, well, not tax free, but tax um, way less taxed income. It's, it's like half the amount that I'm paying in my personal name. And I'm also going to be able to trade stocks while paying a lot less tax, but I'm finding some new methods that I'm learning that I will be introducing to you guys on this channel for anybody that is interested. But this should be a fun little thing that we're gonna be talking about on this channel in the coming weeks as I'm finalizing up that corporate account. So while I'm doing that, you can see that I've been adjusting most of my personal assets toward dividend stocks because I'll never sell those and there's nothing better than just having some extra income to lean into at any given time. I mean, you could also look at my dividend portfolio as an emergency fund. I mean, realistically, having that extra $600 a month tapped into 100% tax-free almost is a pretty enlightening feeling, right? I mean, that's what we're all trying to achieve here. But I also want to keep my growth on track, so I'm trying to figure out what exactly I'm doing. But we can see basically my growth stocks being QQQM, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook. I really love those being my primary core growth stocks. I don't feel like you can lose holding these kind of companies. Now, I guess you should just be aware, I'm only holding about 20 positions. I do not want to scale much past over time, maybe 25 to 30 in the next few years. I'm constantly trying to mitigate the portfolio as much as possible because I keep telling you guys, if you're buying individual stocks, whether you're doing it quarterly, month, monthly, or even once a year, you're going to need to sit down and make sure these companies are still on track. They're still doing okay and they're not being highly detrimented to some news that may evolve because Unfortunately, guys, things change. If you're buying individual stocks, it's very risky. I'm not a financial advisor. Don't do anything that I have been showing you here. You don't need to buy any of these stocks. But I do recommend that if you are going to go down that path, that sometimes the ETF path can be much better and much safer. And just to give you a wildly insane example, because my portfolio, I've been very fortunate to achieve about a 30 three or 34% return a year. But realistically, most people aren't achieving that buying individual stocks. But taking a look, guys, why even waste your time trying to do what I'm doing here when if you're willing to just look at something like a VOO and you don't want to have to look at quarterly earning reports or do what I'm doing, you can simply get an insane return. Because I mean, like over the last decade, take a look at this, guys, VOO is up 260%. That's literally more than a 20% return a year. So again, think about it. If you have $200,000 like I do, that's 20,000 on every 100K, which means if I just wanted to take a take it back, relax guys, and not worry about managing all of this and not care about the dividend income and heck, maybe just sell some of the stock now and again to profit, I'd realistically be making $40,000 a year right now if I just liquidated this whole thing and put it into the Vanguard S&P. But as I told you guys, because I'm able to consistently outperform the S&P 500, and I have for the last seven years, I still feel it's relatively appropriate for me to continue managing my portfolio. But if I ever start to fall off or things just don't start working out in the right manner, who knows, maybe you guys can stick around long enough to see the day that 
I just liquidate my portfolio and put it in an ETF. But in light of all this, I want to pass the question off to you guys. Uh, how are you doing in this market? How do you feel about your portfolio? Where are your dividend goals going? Where are you at? I'm trying to get to about $10,000 in annual dividend income. I wanted to achieve that sooner rather than later, but because of this new corporate account, I'm going to be allocating my money and my corporate stocks a lot differently than my personal ones. So consider subscribing for that. But in light of all this, stay cool, stay awesome, and I look forward to catching you tomorrow.